Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Michael Linke, and once again, on behalf of the Australian Institute of Architects, it's fantastic to have you join me again today. Today, we look at architectural sustainability, and to bring everyone on a journey to net zero emissions, we need to make it easy. So today, we're going to look at a simple three-step journey that we can take so that each of our clients and our sub-consultants can join us on this journey to help them build confidence and understand around carbon emissions and how we can abate them. This is about progress, not perfection. It's about mainstreaming a carbon neutral future. As always, today's session will be recorded and the recording will be available later on on our dedicated Lean In page. And what I'll do is I'll put the link into our Lean In page in the chat box below. You'll see it down there. Speaking of the chat box, pop your questions that you have into the chat box and what I'll do is I'll go through them with Jeremy at the end of the session. I am, as always, thrilled to join, uh, be joined today by a fantastic speaker and today we're joined by Jeremy McLeod, the Director of Breathe Architecture. You've probably heard of Breathe Architecture. They're a team of fantastically dedicated architects that have built a, re a reputation for delivering very high quality design and sustainable architecture for all scale projects. Breathe Architecture has uh, been focusing on sustainable urbanisation and in particular they've been investigating on how to deliver more affordable urban housing to people here in Melbourne. Breathe, as you probably know, are the instigators of the Commons Housing Project in Brunswick and are now collaborating with other architects to deliver the Nightingale model, which is an open source housing model led by architects. Jeremy believes that Architects through collaboration can drive real positive change in every city around Australia. And he joins me on the program now. Jeremy McLeod, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Uh, thanks, Michael. Great introduction. I hope I, I hope I live up to your expectations. Um, yeah, look, um, I want to thank the Institute for the opportunity and I want to thank you all for joining me today. I want to talk to you about um, Breathe Architecture's journey to um, carbon neutrality. And I also might talk to you about, just quickly about the kind of the key moves that we make as architects around building carbon neutral buildings. So I might go a little bit off script, so please bear with me. Firstly, um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, uh, six kilometres north of Melbourne CBD, on land that was never ceded. Um, and a land that the Wurundjeri still have a continu continuing connection with. I'll talk about the history of architecture, perhaps my history of architecture. Um, so I studied uh, uh, sustainable design at the University of Tasmania and then went on to study architecture at the University of Tasmania. I come from a family of um, social activists and environmentalists. And um, my first job out of university <laughs> post-recession um, was this project, the Crown Casino. It was the only uh, was the only job in town in '97, and it was um, yeah, it was interesting for me to work on. And I think that you know, as a as an architect interested in kind of social justice, justice and sustainability, I think that it put my karma level in the red, and I've been trying to trade back out of there ever since. Interesting thing for me as an architect working in Australia is watching what's been happening economically and then watching what's been happening uh, with climate change and also watch what's been happening with our, you know, with, with our inequity in our society and how all those things uh, have been happening simultaneously. And to me, I don't really understand how these things can happen simultaneously, but they have in our society. And I'm going to kind of step out kind of the big things that have been happening. So firstly, we've had 28 years of economic growth leading up to the end of 2019, obviously. We're the wealthiest country per capita in the world, and it's generally kind of linked to um, our housing wealth. Yet we have 116,000 people at the last census living with homelessness. And so um, this year's census is going to be very interesting to see that number skyrocket. And unfortunately, um, we're the third highest carbon emitters per capita. Um, so how can we have both incredible economic prosperity and have such incredible levels of homelessness um, and such high carbon emissions per capita? And so, uh, t you know, I guess I view the world in a quite binary way. And so for me, it looks like the system is broken and that we can't wait for a top-down approach. We can't wait for our federal government to come and mandate um, 
you know, what, what it is that we need to do for our energy sector to take coal out of that energy mix. Well, we can't wait for um, a federal government to mandate a zero carbon uh, national construction code. So if the system is broken, we have to design a new system. And I think that what that means is that we all have to take responsibility as corporations, as um, business people, as architects, as individuals to uh, bring equity um, back to the discussion about climate change, back to the discussion about social justice and housing. And we need to do, we need to all do that individually and we need to push it back up. So what can we do as architects? So firstly, we can get our own house in order. And thanks for the introduction, Michael, but that's what this session was fundamentally about. Um, and I want to talk to you about three really simple steps to do that. And so you would all, um, you know, have etched in your memories, the bushfires at the end of 2019, at the start of 2020. Uh, at the same time, I was one of the founding signatories to Architects Declare, and um, it became abundantly uh, clear to us that architects were looking for a way to step up um, and to deal with climate change head on. And I think the fires really uh, catalyzed for us the, the need to act very, very fast. Um, so we decided that these were the three simple steps that we needed to do, that as organisations, that we need to be carbon neutral, because how could we advocate for our clients uh, and our builders and our developers uh, to deliver carbon neutral buildings or net zero emissions buildings if we weren't carbon neutral ourselves. So we thought the important thing was to get our own houses in order and walk the walk. And you'd all be happy to know that um, under Helen Lockheed that the, uh, and Julia Cambridge that the Institute of Architects are now going down this exact path. Um, they're embarking on their carbon audit. They're buying 100% green power. And by the end of this year, they will be carbon neutral. So you can all be proud members to know that our institute is a leading institute in this space in Australia. So we met with about 115 architects in Melbourne on one night when we could still get together in Melbourne. And we talked about what were the, what were the key things that we could do. Um, and we decided that we would run a social media campaign and that we would, all of the architects in the room would post uh, on three days in January saying, one, on day one, our country is burning. We need to act now. On day two, in 2020, we're going carbon neutral. And then on day three, we're gonna to switch to 100% green power by January 30, 2020. The important thing about 100% green power is that um, uh, most of our energy mix in this country is um, black or brown coal, um, with a small portion of that taken up in uh, wind, hydro and solar. And obviously, uh, as more and more people take up solar that that mix starts to change but it's still about you know over 80 percent of our mix is in is in coal our federal government hasn't renewed uh, julia gillard's um, uh, emission targets which means that there's no top-down approach to change the energy sector and in fact the coal sector is cross-subsidized by our taxes through the federal government so the way to change the energy mix and the single biggest emitter of um, greenhouse gas emissions in this country is to change to 100% green power. So 100% certified green power is a market driven approach which drives the market to change, um, to change their supply chain or to change generations from uh, coal generators to wind or solar. So um, that's the way that you, that you change you know, um, change the market from the bottom up. Um, after we posted those three tiles, um, we, we put a call out to architects to join us and architects across the country joined us on, um, on Instagram. And so this is kind of a snapshot of, you know, of Instagram, you know, after that, um, after that third day of posting. And so over 800 architects across the country declared to go carbon neutral in 2020. Um, and some of those architects are, you know, some of the most awarded uh, biggest practices in the country, you know, like John Wardle Architects, uh, like Bates Smart, like DKO, um, you know, these are big practices, Kirsten Thompson Architects, uh, ARM, DCM. Um, and so they're big employers, but they committed to go carbon neutral. And a lot of them have already embarked on and completed their carbon uh, audit and have already, you know, taken a step to become carbon neutral. Um, so 
we spoke to kind of, you know, and, and again, Architects Declare, we spoke to three different kind of organisations about, and there's many more of them. So you can, you, if you haven't already signed up to um, Architects Declare, I would strongly urge you to think about that. Um, so if you agree that, um, that there is a climate emergency, then sign up to Architects Declare. If you, degree, if you agree that there is a biodiversity em emergency, um, and if any of you haven't seen David Attenborough's uh, documentary on Netflix, I suggest you look at that, then sign up to Architects Declare. But, with, but basically within Architects Declare, we interviewed a number of different um, um, carbon audit companies, uh, the Carbon Reduction Institute, Pangolin Associates and, Associates and Point Advisory. And each of those are offering specific um, services to architects. And so I know that Point Advisory is working with Julia Cambridge and the AIA team. Um, Carbon Reduction Institute is undertaking the, um, the audit for, uh, for the Institute of Architects. So you can talk to any of these organisations or have a look at Architects Declare and you can find other organisations which you can help to take you carbon neutral. At the same time as all of that was happening, Architects Assist kicked off. So if you're wondering how else you could help post bushfires, you can um, contact Architects Assist through the Institute of Architects. This is um, a, fi a firefighter's um, family in Cabago. And so Breathe Architecture are helping. Uh, sorry, I just got muted for a minute. Um, so um, uh, this is a project that we're working on for one of the uh, survivors of Cabago. And then what's the possibility of tomorrow look like? Um, and so for us, beyond being carbon neutral, um, we're looking at how do we make an impact in, in building carbon neutral buildings. So we've been working on, car on Nottingale housing projects with Nottingale housing alongside Six Degrees, Austin Maynard Architects, Claire Cousins Architects and Kennedy Nolan. And that's a triple bottom line housing project that focuses on carbon neutral housing. And it also focuses on delivering um, housing that's affordable and it focuses on building community. Um, it's about housing for people. It's about delivering housing at cost. And we're working with uh, superannuation companies to bring down that cost every day. Importantly, it's carbon neutral housing. No, uh, look, no. so our, our approach to carbon neutrality at Breathe kind of looks you know, fundamentally like this. Um, if you don't need it, uh, take it out. So we think about embodied carbon in our projects. So um, often we'll take out, uh, so in Nightingale 1, we took out the, all the glazing and the framing from the stair and instead we use chain, chain wire mesh fencing to enclose the stair and it becomes an outdoor stair. This idea of building less to give more. So, you know, rather than building um, uh, uh, individual laundries into each of the apartments. There's a shared laundry on the roof and a big kind of, you know, shared laundry space, shared rooftop gardens rather than kind of, you know, individual gardens. That's a lot about sharing, um, shared packaged heat pumps that does the hot water. Importantly, and I think that I really want to get this message across, um, say no to gas. So gas is a fossil fuel um, and we need to electrify if we have any chance at all of meeting, of keeping our global warming below 1.5 or 2 degrees. So we have to electrify and we have to electrify now. So um, talk to all of your consultants and say no to gas. Um, it has to be uh, induction cooktops, uh, packaged heat pumps doing your hot water. Um, and so for us, what does that look like? So Melbourne is a heating climate. We use a CO2 heat pump. Um, and the, the benefit of a CO2 heat pump under, uh, uh, over a standard heat pump is obviously a heat, a heat pump is a very, very efficient way to heat water for domestic hot water and for hydronic heating. Um, but a CO2 heat pump doesn't have any refrigerants in it. And the problem with refrigerants is that they make up about 7% of global warming potential. So if you can take the refrigerants out and use CO2, that's much, much better. Um, we use radiant heating rather than um, air heating. So... Uh, Rather than using a split system, we'll use hydronic heating in Melbourne. And obviously that's gonna be different uh, response in, uh, in northern climates. We cool through passive solar techniques um, and we work with induction. So induction is 40% more efficient than gas. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, induction creates a magnetic field and your pot heats up based on that magnetic field. So uh, it's not uh, resistant electric rate, uh, energy, it is highly efficient. Um, 
So we use kind of two, the, the, the big thing that people struggle with or that services consultants struggle with is hot water heating. So we use automatic heating in Epping in Melbourne. So that works for us. And we also use Stiebel Eltron units. Um, so talk to them about your heat pumps and ask if possible to use CO2 heat pumps. And then the other big thing is that um, everyone worries or, or when we're working with property developers, they worry about uh, EMDs or electricity maximum demand. So how much energy do you need at any one time? And if you need too much energy at any one time, it means that you need a bigger substation and they're worried about the cost of the infrastructure of that substation and the space that takes. So we kind of work through how do we lower the, the EMD? And fundamentally, the way that an EMD um, works is that it adds up all of, your, um, all of your energy demand. And as it adds up, so you might start with a basic heating load, and then you'll add the hot water heating load to that, and then you'll add your lighting and appliances to that. And so what happens is that as you add each of that load on top of each other at peak times, so at 6am in the morning through to 9am in the morning, for example, in a residential building, that's the peak load time. And in the evening when everyone comes home and turns on their air conditioners, again, that's a peak time. And so that ends up, you know, driving that uppermost peak and that's called your EMD or your electricity maximum demand. And so how can we bring that down? And fundamentally it's through time or load shifting. So it's changing when those peaks occur. And so if you look at this one and this one, there's still the same amount of loads, but the loads are happening at different time. So, in Nightingale One, for example, the hot water heats during off-peak. The heating uh, through the hydronic heating heats off-peak, both through a heat pump, and then that heat is stored in a buffer tank, so a big uh, insulated stainless steel tank which holds all the hot water in there. The lighting and the appliances, you can't do anything about that. That's still going to happen when people are getting up in the morning and when people get home from work. But they become the peak load times, and that pushes the EMD down, which means that when you walk past Nightingale 1, there's no substation there. So we didn't lose any retail space at the front to a substation and we didn't have to pay $150,000 to City Power to put that substation in. Um, you can also use solar to lower your EMD. So um, the only problem generally is that solar, you know, generally generates power um, in the middle of the day. But in, again, depending on you know, what sort of building it is, if it's a residential building or a hotel, um, the peak loads tend to happen in the mornings and the evenings, whereas you know, solar happens you know, in the middle of the day. And so you can start to, you can start to shift that by using solar. Um, and then you can use a battery to shift when that solar is used. So you can push that you know, into the morning and the, and the evening with the battery and suddenly really push your EMD down. And obviously that's going to get cheaper over time. I think for a lot of you working with property developers, um, everyone's worried about, you know, the cost of electrification. Is it more expensive to buy a heat pump? The answer to that is yes, but gas reticulation and gas meter enclosures are also expensive. And so for those of you that have seen Arcadia that we did with DKO, um, basically, Defence Housing Australia ran a cost benefit analysis and realised that it was going to be a, a cost neutral proposition to take all of the gas out of the building and electrify the entire building. Our residents then get cheaper power through a bulk buy power through an embedded network. So our residents get cheaper, 100% green power, no carbon emissions through their occupation of the building and no gas pumped into the building. So it's ready for a pathway to net zero emissions. And what can we do as individuals? Um, so firstly, and, and the, the most important thing is switch to 100% green power. Um, so I would urge you all to screenshot this, write it in your diaries, put it in your phone now. And in fact, I would, I would beg you all to do this. So um, switching to 100% green power, you know, um, we've incentivized the staff at Breathe to do that um, because it's such an important, simple move. So it costs four cents a kilowatt hour extra for your power supply. Um, so it's actually, it's a tiny, tiny cost. So can you all please switch to 100% green power and actually stick it in the chat later that, you know, or, or now, that, you know, if you're gonna do that, or if you're already on that, I'd love Michael to find out who's doing that or who could commit to that. Um, if your current provider doesn't already do that, then it's time to switch. Um, and about 
in Victoria, there's 36 retailers um, and about 31 of those retailers all have the green power as an offering. Importantly, um, we're stronger together. So um, as an organisation, so the Institute of Architects going carbon neutral, as those 800 architects have all declared to go carbon neutral, what we're starting to see is um, engineers declare, um, uh, builders declare, and what we've seen is that um, some of our sub-consultants, so RLB, our cost consultants, are now embarking on a carbon audit. Um, you know, we've got our, um, our, our services consultants, which are now going carbon neutral. Um, uh, our electrical engineers are going carbon neutral. So um, a, a lot of our consultants are now going carbon neutral as well. And I know that at Nightingale Housing, Nightingale Housing have made it abundantly clear through their consultant engagement process that they will only engage consultants that are carbon neutral or have a pathway to carbon neutral. So if they get a choice between two consultants that are carbon neutral or two architects, you know, one that's carbon neutral and one isn't, they will go with the architect or with the consultant that is carbon neutral. And I think that we're seeing the same thing working with universities. So I think that if we all do this together, we can have a bottom down, oh, sorry, a, a bottom up approach. Um, so yeah, we're strong together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. And I would say as well, for those of you on the call, um, again, just apologies, we've got so many people trying to get into today's session that um, a few of you um, have struggled just waiting in the queue, but um, the majority of us are all in. So um, thanks for joining us. Now, there are a couple of questions and we do want to, that was a pretty quick presentation to what we're generally used to on a lean in, which is great. So what I would say is we've got, now got plenty of time to take your questions. Uh, for Jeremy. So I'm going to kick off with the first one. And this is in relation to peak loads. And this is a really interesting question that's come in from Andrew McLeod. And Andrew says, look, Jeremy, are the future of peak loads changing with COVID changing the nature of workplaces? I mean, the majority of, especially us here in Melbourne, the majority of the CBD now sits empty uh, and is, is decaying away effectively. What's happening to peak loads? Well, the interesting thing, Andrew, is that... Um the peak load has historically always been in summer afternoons, um, you know, on the southeast coast of Australia. So, um, and, and as we have a historically, uh, in fact, you know, the answer to this question is I don't know because, you know, who knows what's happening post COVID. But um, I think that the big issue in the past was everyone going home, turning on their air conditioner after work, you know, in, in a hot uh, in a hot summer afternoon. That's when the grid really struggled. And that's when we're having brownout and blackout experiences. So um, I do think the, the other thing that we're seeing is that the technology like Reposit or GreenSync um, giving us the ability uh, or giving um, energy retailers like um, PowerShop and Amber the ability to switch on or switch off uh, um, appliances or, or essentially road, load shift at peak times means that we're all part of that solution. So if we've got a... a 100% electric building. And if we're signing that building up or designing that building with an embedded network with, um, with a repository or a green sink uh, technology in there, which enables it to load shift at peak times, it means that we're all part of the energy solution, you know, and we don't need Scott Morrison to sort it out for us. Mm. A an interesting question as well. Many suppliers out there rave about, you know, their their green power, um, you know, it's 100% solar, whatever it might be. And there's a lot of quite fantastic claims that are coming out. Now, this is an interesting question from Damien. And he says, look, how do we know then that the green power being offered is actually green? Yeah, so it's really important. Um, while, while PowerShop is the only energy supplier in Victoria to commit to Julia Gillard's renewable energy target, um, PowerShop still offer 100% carbon offset power. Carbon offset power means that they can buy power from a coal generation um, source and then offset that with some cheap carbon offsets in, uh, in China or in India. So if you want to affect market change, you have to buy 100% certified green power, not carbon offset power. So the difference is that 100% um, certified green power is an audited process. And basically what they do is through that audited process, they buy large scale re renewable generation certificates out of the marketplace and they hold those. And every time you buy green power, they essentially tear those large scale certificates up. And so there is a finite number of those certificates available in the marketplace. The more we buy of them, 
the more it means that the, that the generators have to provide renewables to fill up that, that, that trading marketplace. So don't buy carbon offset power. It doesn't mean anything. Buy 100% certified green power if you want to change the energy mix. I mean, it's not that it doesn't mean anything. It's still good, but it doesn't change the energy mix in Australia. Mm. Okay. Let's talk about Nightingale, the work that you're very well known for here in Melbourne. How do your roles and responsibilities as an architect change when working on, you know, a standard, I would say, a commercial project, and then, then you come to talk about Nightingale? How does your role evolve? How does it become different when working with Nightingale? So um, there's uh, Dan McKenna is the general manager at Nightingale, and he runs uh, Nightingale Housing day to day. Um, there's a board at Nightingale Housing of which, you know, James Legg from Six Degrees sits on um, and Angela Perry is the, is the, kind of, is the chair of that board. Um, so, the, so really a lot of my engagement with Nightingale Housing now might be through Breathe Architecture working as a design architect on a Nightingale project. But fundamentally, the difference is, imagine being told by a client, um, can you come and, so Nightingale engages Breathe, and they say, can you come and do this project? We'd like it to be carbon neutral. We'd, lo we, we'd like to deliver it, you know, at no profit. We'd like to deliver it as affordably as possible. And want to make sure we engage uh, holistically with the existing community um, and with the community that are going to be there from the outset. So it's actually, it's just like a dream. So, you know, we've just, you know, we've just built the perfect dream client for us. Mm. This is a question from Jo, who's been on the chat, and she asked you this question. Do you consider, Jeremy, the embodied energy in the materials and the components you specify in your projects? Is there a reference material that you use as a guide, or do you just try to source locally? And then how local? Do you do that within Australia? Do you do that, say, 100 kilometres from the CBD or 50 k from the site? She's just sort of keen to know what your thoughts are on that. So it's a really, really uh, specific question. So yes, we consider embodied energy, but if you think about uh, this idea of progress rather than perfection, so where can we play to win? So firstly, as an organisation to go carbon neutral, that's the easiest thing that we can all do. So for us at Breathe Architecture, you know, it cost us uh, $1,600 for our carbon, carbon audit. It costs us about, um, and there's 22 staff at Breathe, and it costs us about, uh, $650 a year for our carbon offsets. Um, and the carbon auditor did most of the work with our bookkeeper. It was actually incredibly straightforward. Um, so as an organisation, that was the simplest thing. So can I please all urge you to call one of those people and go carbon neutral and come and join us uh, at Architects Declare on that. Um, the second most important thing is operational carbon. Um, because if you think about, you know, what's the stack of, you know, embodied carbon versus operational carbon, if we do our jobs right, and we're building a building to last 50 years or 100 years, um, you know, 80% of that building's carbon will be, in op it will be emitted through operational carbon. Um, and so the easy thing there is take out gas, electrify the building, and then commit your client um, to 100% uh, certified green power. Um, and so we do a lot of education with our clients in here. Um, the embodied carbon is, is a tougher kind of frontier. And I know that Len Lease are doing a couple of uh, LCA, life cycle, life cycle assessments on their projects, working out how much embodied carbon is going in to those projects and then offsetting anything that's remaining after the building process. Nightingale is only embarking on its first um, zero carbon building. So all of their buildings are zero carbon in operations, but there's only one, Nightingale Anstey, which is being built at the moment, which is going through an LCA to, have, to make sure that any embodied carbon is offset through that process. So, Joe, back to your question. Um, we have a materials handbook that we, that we wrote at Breathe, um, specifically for Nightingale, and it talks through... Um, a decision-making kind of pathway on every material. So if you have to have concrete compared to CLT, you know, um, why would you make that decision? And one of them's about longevity or is it fit for purpose? And then what do you do about your cement replacement, you know, and where are you getting your cement replacement from? If you have to buy, if you have to specify timber, where is that timber from? And there's kind of a four-pronged approach on that. So firstly, locally sourced FSC, or sorry, locally sourced recycled. Secondly, locally sourced FSC. Third, locally sourced PEFC. Uh, fourth, locally sourced AFS, you know. So it's kind of a decision-making pathway to, to get to that. 
we always try to find, you know, if there's an existing building, we'll always try to, you know, wherever possible, build in adaptive reuse and absorb that carbon that's already been expended on that. Um, and beyond that, wherever possible, you know, um, we'll use some recycled materials in the building. Um, and so you'll see that, uh, you know, a lot of our buildings might have recycled timber floors um, or recycled bricks. We've never specified a new brick in 20 years of architecture because of the embodied carbon in new bricks until this year when Brickworks have released their carbon neutral brick. Um, and so they've, they've now got a carbon neutral brick coming out of Wallert, um, which is 22 kilometres north of, you know, a, a Brunswick project that we're building. So for the first time in 20 years, I'm now finally able to specify a brick knowing that um, the building's envelope is going to be carbon neutral. And so the reason that DKO and Breathe worked so hard to have all of those recycled bricks, 420,000 recycled bricks in Arcadia, was about pulling out the embodied energy. Um, and it was a challenge, you know. We had to kind of source them for years. <laughs> Anyway, Joe, I'm sorry. It's a it's a complex question, but you, but you, basically, your your questions are all correct. That's exactly the way that your decision making process should work. Perfect. Thanks, Jeremy. Let's talk about culture. You have 22 people at Breathe Architecture. You're very well known for living and breathing carbon neutrality. How? And this is a question that's coming from Paul, and he asks about the process and the attitude, I suppose, the mindset and the lifestyle of your staff that work for you. How have they changed? since you know taking your lead is something is carbon neutrality just a standard sort of um, byword with them oh uh, look i think that um you know when we advertise for staff we make it pretty clear that um uh when you work at breathe you know we see ourselves not just as architects but as also advocates for the planet and advocates for the people that live in our cities um so i think a lot of people come to breathe with their eyes wide open and we talk to them a lot about um what does sustainability mean to them? And so when you get architects like Bonnie Herring or Fairley Batch or Madeline Sewell who are 100% committed to the mission, um, it, makes it, it makes it totally possible. Um, and so the people that come in to breathe, we're, we're incredibly blessed that the people that come to breathe, very young staff. So a lot of our applicants get this, a lot of our applicants are female and a lot of them are under 35. So it's a, it seems to be, you know, it's, you know, Anecdotally, you would see, you'd seen that females care more about sustainability and millennials care more about sustainability than um, males aged over 35. Any males uh, aged over 35 out there, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, anecdotally, that seems to be the, the, what's happening there. But look, you know, we make it, we, we're unapologetic about what it is that we're trying to do. And um, our crew all are totally committed to, you know, to trying to make a positive difference on the built environment. Let's talk about large commercial buildings now. Kim has um, been watching your presentation and she asks a question related to facades in large commercial buildings. And she says, look, can they perform better in terms of lower embodied energy and potential operational energy? Are there any novel solutions in this field of research? Do you know of any that uh, are looking into this? Yeah, I've got a novel solution. It's called uh, window to wall ratio. So. New York has, has banned curtain wall buildings. So the best double glazing we can get here has a U value of about 1.3. Um, the worst wall insulation that we can build has a U value 10 times better than that. So if you want to reduce your operational energy, um, think about your window to wall ratios and this idea of the curtain wall building um, and there are ways to do it, right, with spandrel glass and insulation behind that. So you can deal with the aesthetic. Um, but uh, I think that as architects, we need, to, we need to understand that. And then I think the other, the other question is, um, yeah, I think that the problem, Kim, is that, that embodied energy is only 20% of the problem and 80% of it is operational energy. So we have to get the building working as efficiently as possible to be able to resolve the operational side. A question from Isabella. This is great. You'd love this because her architectural practice that Isabella works for is going carbon neutral or, you know, the, taking the first steps to achieve carbon neutrality. Where, in that where does Isabella work? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'll Google that in a second. Unless, Isabella, you want to pop that into Isabella, the chat. You've got, you got to tell us because we've got to give them a shout out. 
Okay, there you go. So Izzy, you've got to jump on the chat and tell us who you work for. So anyway, Isabella's architectural practice is trying to go carbon neutral and they're taking the first steps to achieve that. Now they have a landlord who's in a contract with an energy provider, but the problem is that the energy provider, as many of them are, like to lock in a contract for two years. Now that's going to affect other firms too. Um, now, not being a particularly um, skilled non-lawyer that I am, it probably would be difficult to get out of a contract that's been locked in already if you, you know, you're looking to go to an alternative energy supplier. Uh, any steps, any advice, any guidance on how you'd recommend maybe getting out of that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the good things that's happened out of the kind of the work oh, on the... By the way, she's at O'Neill Architecture in Brizzy. Oh, good on you, Isabella. Good on you, O'Neill. Well, well done. Um, so... Um, yeah, one of the good things that's been happening out of this kind of, you know, looking at regulation in the energy sector is that one of the big problems is that embodied energy, sorry, embedded networks historically were about buying bulk power, bulk black power um, really cheaply and then selling it back to the residents at a really expensive rate. And so in Victoria, the planning minister um, in, in, in the lead to last election banned embedded networks. And if you want to run an embedded network now, it has to pass through the savings back to the residents. In all of that, and I'm not sure, Isabella, whether it applies in Queensland, but I'm pretty sure it's a national regulation. Uh, in Victoria, I know for sure there's a thing called the power of choice, which means that you get to choose who your energy retailer is. So no one, no one, no matter what their contract is, can tell you as an individual or as an organisation who your energy provider can be. You have the power of choice. That's what that whole piece of legislation is about. So all you need to do is to say to your landlord, I'm going to execute my rights under the power of choice. I'm going to change suppliers. I want new meters put in because if you can't do it through your embedded network, I'm going to change that. And so in through all of that, you will be able to negotiate the outcome that you want because the last thing your landlord's going to want to do is to pay for some capital expenditure to upgrade the meters and the switchboards. Okay, interesting. I hope that helps you, Isabella. That's um, a great answer. I would say as well, because we've still got plenty of time left. We've got 20 minutes before, the, before we have to shoot off to other things. But um, of course, Jeremy, if anybody has got any questions for you, if you want to maybe do a shout out on your email address or a website or anything like that, what's the best way to, for people to get in contact with you? Should they have other questions? Look, you can, you can send me an email, jeremy at breathe.com.au. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll help where we can. So, you know, that, that sort of thing really frustrates me, Isabella. So if there's anything that we can do to help crack that door for you, we will. Great stuff. There you go. Isabella, I hope that's of help to you and, and good luck engaging with Jeremy. I'm sure he'll um, be a great support and advocate for you. Let's talk about an issue that Katrina has raised, and this is a really fascinating one. Now, this is in relation to electricity and how it goes into the grid, right? So if all your electricity goes into the grid to be used, then your electricity retailer can't directly feed the electricity from a renewable generator into your house or workplace. Instead, it's added to the grid, I suppose, on your behalf. Now, that means that green power is not necessarily coming from solar power or wind power. So Katrina's point is this. She says, isn't it better, therefore, perhaps to advocate for off-grid solar panels with a battery backup, particularly for the larger architecture firms you mentioned earlier, who, you know, we're talking about the cost maybe being prohibitive. What are your thoughts? Look, the, the problem is, you know, is fundamentally, the, firstly, the cost of batteries to be able to go off grid. Secondly, that, um, that, that that technology is high in embodied energy. And so there are minerals in those batteries that you don't want to use unless you have to. And thirdly, that being part of the grid, part of being a national grid, um, it means that we all be, get to be part of the solution. If we just all become isolationist and decide, no, I'm just going to operate my own building with my own solar panels and my own battery, I'm not going to help the hospital in their peak demand times by them being able to, you know, use the solar generated on my rooftop when we're all at work. So you're absolutely right that the, the, the national energy grid has a national energy mix, which is made up of um, black coal, brown coal, wind, hydro, solar. When you buy 100% certified green power, those electrons that are coming from, from, for you, you don't know that those electrons are coming from wind or from solar, they might be coming from brown coal. But what you do know when you buy 100% certified green power is that every electron generated from um, a renewable source has a renewable energy certificate that goes with that. And when you buy that, that certificate is torn up and then the marketplace has to provide a replacement certificate, which means they have to generate more renewables. So you're right in that the electrons you're getting might be from some other source, but it's an it's a audited, you know, accounting piece which makes sure that 
when you're buying that, you're changing the energy mix. Mm. Let's talk about small practice. We've talked about, you know, large uh, commercial buildings. Let's talk about our members in small practice. And these are the ones who generally can't af- afford, you, you know, a huge move to carbon neutrality because the cost can be somewhat prohibitive. One of my members um, has approached me, and this is in relation to them setting up a small architecture practice. So they're going through the stages of now just setting up their own practice. They're branching out under their own steam. Now, they don't really have a physical office. They're mostly mobile. They're on the road, uh, out seeing clients and that sort of thing, but very passionate about carbon neutrality, very keen to buy an electric vehicle in due course once that can be afforded. Any thoughts on carbon neutrality for an office that's on the move? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that Julia Cambridge is working with um, Point Advisory Group on is basically a thing for AIA members to be able to easily kind of click through. Um, and so we know that on average, an office, uh, an architect working in an office, from the from the advice that we've been given um, from uh, Carbon Reduction Institute and from Pangolin, is about 12 tonnes of carbon per year per employee. And so basically what point advisory will do will talk to you about what it is that you're doing and that they'll offer you a very very small practice um, fee to do that work so so the AIA is actively advocating in that space but I think that don't be concerned about contacting point advisory or carbon reduction institute and and explaining your situation Um, I know that carbon reduction institute have done a number of free or pro bono um, carbon audits for very small practices because it's so easy for them. It's, you know, it's number of flights, uh, it's how many kilometres travelled and, you know, are you buying 100% power? You know, it's, it's, some, it's some pretty simple things. And so, um, and then, you know, I know that a couple of practices, their offsets were like, you know, $130 a year. Um, so, and, and also don't, don't, don't forget the benefit it gives you as a practice being able to say, you know, we're a carbon neutral practice I know that, you know, it was never the intent of Breathe to position ourselves that way from a marketing perspective, but it helps us when work with university or government clients or with clients that have a particular view because they care about sustainability. So it's actually helped position us in the marketplace. And I think that it's helped change Breathe's trajectory from smaller projects to bigger projects. So um, yet I don't think it'll be particularly onerous. Contact um, Charlie at Point Advisory or contact Garth at Carbon Reduction Institute, um, you know, and see what they say. It'll be painless. Great stuff. We like painless examples. That's great. Thank you. Let's stick with small business. So do you have any recommendations for small practices when they're trying to undertake their own carbon audits? Um, And I suppose the question, this is from Martin, who's come in on the chat. And Martin asks, how do you ensure that you cover all of your emissions to buy sufficient carbon offset credits? Yeah, so you engage a professional to do that. Like, I don't think architects, we're we're not, you know, not a breed, we're not equipped to do that. So we engage a professional to do that. Again, Martin, talk to Charlie at Point Advisory or Garth at uh, Carbon Reduction Institute, ask them for a concessional price, tell them Jeremy sent you. (laughs) And, um, and, and, And you'll find that they'll do all the heavy lifting for you. They've got engineers, they've got software, you know, they'll put it all into the software. Um, and it's actually relatively straightforward. I suppose sometimes when we talk about, you know, engaging a professional, I think ding, 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 there's a lot of money out of my wallet gone. I mean, have you got a sort of an idea about price? Well, so again, for us, you know, with 22 staff, it was, um, it was like $1,600. Like it was really affordable for us to do the carbon audit. Um, and then, yeah, other people have told me that it's cost them, you know, $500 for their carbon audit. Right. So. Okay. So not too exorbitant, They're not, you know, in the, you know, $20,000 mark or anything like that. Nothing too prohibitive. Like, you know, maybe if you're a massive practice with, you know, um, with 200 staff, you know, maybe it might cost you $20,000. You know, maybe if someone is, you know, from Wardle is here, they might be able to tune in and tell us what it costs for their carbon audit. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I think they've got over 100 staff, you know. Yeah. Absolutely fine. There's been a lot of interest in the 100% certified green power list of providers. Do you have an access to a list of those providers that you would warrant and say, yep, these are are really fantastic energy providers who do provide, you know, unadulterated, pure green energy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, not that I want to act as an energy retailer. No, there's no commission going on here. Yeah. <laughs> no commission. So we buy our power at Nightingale um, through Tasmanian Hydro and Momentum. So talk to Momentum and then there's a little slide bar and just slide that bar all the way to the right, which says 100% green power. 
Ovo Energy are a new company out of the UK, young upstarts, um, and they they sell you know really good kind of carbon neutral offering. Um, Diamond Energy in Victoria um, only sell renewables, so just make sure that if you're buying from Diamond, to buy 100% green power. Um, for the smaller practices and perhaps in your own lives, if you're really interested in the energy market and you want to play with the energy market, you could use Amber. And so Amber, a couple of young startups, and basically it gives you the ability to spot price. So tune down your usage at peak demand times and then tune it up at other times. Um, it's very interesting. Um, and uh, so, yes, if you're, a, if you're an energy nerd, you'll love Amber. Energy Locals, um, local community group, um, doing uh, Ask Them for 100% um, certified green power. Um, and, of course, the most sustainable um, way to buy your power is through PowerShop. They, as, as I said before, they're the, they're the only ones that backed Gillard's renewable energy targets. Um, PowerShop, in my view, is expensive in the way that they price per kilowatt hour is a little bit opaque. So if, if you're all about the mission and you've got plenty of cash, um, then go to PowerShop. If, you're, um, if you've got a bigger practice and, you, and you're worried about the cost of power, then you know I'd go to you know I'd go to Momentum or um, Energy Locals or Ovo or Diamond. Yeah, I'm going to give you a bit of a warm fuzzy on here. But Angelucci Architects, who are on the call, have just put a note in the chat and they've said thanks very much, Jeremy. They've just checked and they've changed their electricity plan to 100% greenhouse electricity. They said it was super easy. Now they're checking out Path Zero for their carbon neutral audit. So there you go. You've got one convert in one set. Questions. Well done. Thank you. Well done. All right, cool. My work here is done. Well, that's <laughs> 48 <practice>. well spent. <laughs> Good stuff. But um, well done to Angelucci. Now let's move on and let's talk about a couple of small um, questions just related to blockchain technology. And this is an interesting question from Florence. And she says, look, Jeremy, what do you think about using blockchain tech, technology to source power from suppliers such as Enios? Uh, yeah, look, sorry, I, I've never, you know, I've been talking about this um, with some real energy nerds for years. And I'm really sorry. I still don't understand uh, what blockchain is. So I'm sorry. I, I no, that's fine. We'll leave it. We might, we might do another lean in on blockchain and see how it relates to architecture at another date. Let's talk then about community. So it's all good for us and it's great. You know, no, um, no disrespect to Angelucci. That's fantastic. I'm going to go and have a look at my electricity and give Origin the flick. What I would say though, is how I do we bring... Yes, can I just talk about Origin, AGL, hmm. and Energy Australia? three of the biggest polluters in the country. So if you are with Origin or AGL or Energy Australia, please look at how they generate their energy. Perfect. All right. So there's a, a lesson from Jeremy on that one. Let's talk a little bit about bringing people on the journey with us. So it's good for us to obviously look in our own backyard, but how do we better promote community energy projects and to what extent can these help? And this is a question from John on the chat and he references Haystack Solar Garden as a great example. What are your thoughts? Uh, look, I think that it's a complex space. Um, you know, I know Taryn from the Hepburn Wind, you know, she's incredibly kind of uh, engaged, smart individual. I know that, you know, Lane Crockett from IIG, you know, that have got a bunch of money that they're investing in community solar. But um, so, look, I, I think, you know, I think it's great. I also think it's really hard. So, um, you know, at Nightingale Housing, I know that Dan McKenna investigated at Nightingale Housing and instead partnered with Taz Hydro. Um, so basically using uh, a PPA, a power purchase agreement, to be able to bulk buy 100% certified green power and then use that bulk buying across all the Nightingale buildings to then pass on that saving to all the Nightingale residents. So all the Nightingale residents, thanks to that work that Fairley Batch did, you know, way back when and Dan McKenna, all of the residents in Nightingale get 100% green power at about a third of the price that anyone else in the same suburb is paying for black power. So no carbon emissions, one third of the price. So, um, you know, so yeah, I think community, community solar is great. I just, I'm not sure how to make it work. Mm. This is a, a practical tip, and this is from David McLaughlin, who's been on the chat, and it's fascinating. He spent $25. He went to JCAR, and he bought himself a little plug-in energy consumption meter, and he's just put on the chat. He found out what was using power in his practice or, or home, he hasn't said, but he said it's made a huge impact, and just by making some small changes to some of his daily habits, he's reduced his energy consumption by over 50% which is fantastic. So there you go. So $25 investment from JCAR is just one um, nice, easy example. 
Let's talk about a question from Morgan. This is a nice, simple one, yes or no. Do you have to do the carbon audit annually? Uh, yes. Perfect. Only okay. if you want to be carbon neutral every year. Of course, yep. And a question again from Kerry ann This is in relation to self-offsetting. So how does she self-offset through regeneration agriculture? Um, her question, I'm just going to read it. How can I self-offset through regeneration agriculture, my own company's carbon? Oh, I see what she means. Would it be preferable then to self-solve the carbon on her land rather than pay someone an annual fee? Yeah, I, I guess the question is, if you want to be um, certified to be carbon neutral, then you need it you know, independently audited. Um, and, and a lot of us in the built environment will then go on to get a climate active certification alongside our, which is recommend, which is recognised by Architects Declare and recognised by um, the Green Building Council of Australia. So I think, I think, you know, it depends whether you want to be certified and you want to, want, you want to put on your email signature or on your, you know, on your website that you're carbon neutral. If you don't want to do that and you just want to, um, if you just want to offset your own carbon, then you'll have to do some research on what you think which is going to be hard because you're not an expert or a carbon engineer um, on what you think your offsets are or what the average is. And then if, if, if I wasn't paying for their audit, I would just buy double or triple that in terms of offsets. And if you didn't want to buy it, and if you instead you wanted to sequester carbon through uh, tree planting or through, uh, you know, I don't know, putting it in the soil, I think um, that's a whole other piece of work, you know. And then, so, yeah, I think that's awesome. Uh, I just don't know how you measure it. No, that's fine. Let's talk about operational carbon output because if it is so key, and this is a question that's come in from Joe, if operational carbon is so key to the amount of carbon emitted in the building process versus the embodied energy and materials, what's your advice? What's your guidance? What's your recommendations for how we best liaise with service engineers to get the best results for the environment? Um, we're pretty clear with our service engineers. So, um, so take, um, again, we working on a Nightingale housing project, perhaps it's easier, right? So the development manager um, and the project manager sit in the room with the architect and all the services engineers in the first consultant meeting, and they say there will be no gas in this project. It's in the, all the initial briefing projects, and they're saying gas will not be discussed. It's an old technology. It's a fossil fuel. We have to find a 100% electric solution for this. And so there's one conversation had in the first meeting, and then that's it. Um, when I'm working on a project and when I'm, uh, when I'm briefing the consultants uh, for a project, I talk to the mech engineers and the, and the electrical engineers and I tell them, you know, in, in the lead up to the first meeting, that there'll be no conversation about gas, that this building is going to be 100% 100, 100 electric and I don't want to hear anything about gas. So I make it abundantly clear that that's, that's the outset and that's in our briefing documents from the outset. Um, Mechanical engineers, when things get tough, they'll run to gas to, for hot water. Electrical engineers, when they think that they're getting close to an EMD that might you know, trip over into a substation, um, they run to, you know, rather than load shifting, they, they run to what they know and they've done a thousand times before, which will, again, will be, you know, changing back to, you know, gas cooktops or um, gas hot water or gas, you know, condenser boilers for the hydronic heating. So, um, for us, it's about making it abundantly clear from the outset that um, it's like saying, you know, um, you know, it would be easier if we just used the oil heater, you know, at the back, or or maybe we could use the wood chip heater, you know. It's like it's like going back to the fifties. So it's it's I, I think that we just need to make sure that we we explain to the engineers that um, we have to solve for a pathway to net zero emissions by twenty thirty. You cannot do that with gas pumped into your building. And so once you realise that, then gas is off the table and then you're set for a 100% electric building. Many of, many of our members, uh, especially those of us in, in Melbourne, are in apartments. You know, we're locked in and that kind of stuff. And this is an interesting question. This has come from Tamara on the chat. And now she personally lives in a building with an embedded electrical network and the daily charge is up to 30%, to be honest, higher than when she could shop around for an electricity provider of her own choice. And she uses such little energy that the discounted kilowatt rate really has very little impact on her total overall bill. Is that really the best system to be implementing in apartments? No, so that's why Minister Wynne has banned energy, uh, embedded energy networks. And so the only way to get around um, that ban is to then um, put forward an embedded energy network that has to come in 
at under a retail offer. So I'm sorry, who asked the question? Oh, that was from Tamara. Okay, so, so Tamara, yep. again, you have what's called the power of choice. So I bet that your energy, your embedded energy network is operated by um, Origin or by Win Energy or by OC Energy or Active Utilities. So all of those, all of those utilities companies are built around um, um, buying bulk power and selling to you and charging high daily connection rates to generate their profit. Um, you have the power of choice to change that, which means you can, you can demand to be changed to your own standalone retailer. And then they have to provide a meter, a standalone meter, and then you can buy from PowerShop if you want to. What instead you should do is use the, the building. In fact, Tamara, send me an email. I'll put you in touch with an embedded network operator that will, that will buy 100% green power only and pass through all the savings on the daily connection rates. So again, if you live in Nightingale, your daily connection rate is 30 cents a day, not $1.20 a day, which is what you know Diamond might charge, or not $2.30 a day, which is what an embedded network operator might charge. So send me an email tomorrow and I'll hook you up with someone that will solve that problem for you. Get on it Tamara. Reach out to Jeremy. Let's talk about quickly. We've only got a couple of minutes left and I want to squeeze in just two or three, if I can, more questions, if I can um, crave your indulgence on this one. Let's talk about doing house renos. We're doing a house renovation. It's got existing gas hot water services. It's got, you know, standard old good old, you know, gas top cook. Uh, cooktop ovens, you know, gas ducted heating. Uh, what would you do? Rip it out, um, install PV, solar hot water system, heat pumps. What are your recommendations on that sort of approach for a reno? So PV is now paying for itself in about six years. And in fact, with the Andrews rebates, it's, it's um, paying for itself in under five years at the moment. So put as much PV on as you can. If, the, um, if they've just installed a condenser boiler for the hydronic heating and it's new, and it works and it's highly efficient, then keep it. Um, but if you're replacing the cooktop, the oven, um, you know, and you're, and you're replacing all of, these, all of this equipment, just disconnect the gas and, um, you know, buy an induction cooktop, you know, electric oven, uh, a Stiebel Eltron, you know, heat pump for the hot water, you know, and then put some uh, Tindo solar panels on the roof. Um, so I think that it depends on, you know, for us, we have a conversation with our residential clients about gas and a lot of our clients just haven't considered it, you know, and they haven't thought about, you know, their role as individuals towards trying to achieve, you know, um, a pa Paris climate, you know, um, targets. So um, just in having that conversation with our clients, you know, uh, it's incredible. We've seen clients that have kind of, kind of said initially, I have to have a wok burner, you know, and when you ask them what's more important, you know, uh, the wok burner or the planet, you know, I, I know it's, it's not that binary, but, um, and then when you show them a good induction wok, they're like, oh, wow, I didn't even know that existed, you know, um, and the induction wok, you know, heats up twice as fast as a gas-fired wok. So I think that, yeah, I think that use a bit of common sense. If stuff's just been put in, there's obviously embodied energy in that equipment and the plant that's already in there. The problem is that, specifying new gas means that you're locking in the next 15 years of that service life for carbon emissions. There's an interesting comment that's come in from Mahalath and she said, and um, Mahalath says, look, nowhere in this conversation has been the issue of actually reducing energy consumption in the first place, which is true. We, we haven't really talked about that, you know? Um, and so the comment is, is it worse to use, you know, very, a huge amount of kilowatts really from non-renewable sources to huge amounts of, you know, green power and using offsets, I suppose. And the point really, and I suppose all we can do is agree is the first point is to reduce energy demand first through better designing, better architecture, better planning. Yeah, a hundred percent. But again, like, you know, breathe architecture has built an entire career on, you know, um, building more efficient buildings. And we assume that, you know, as two, uh, the NCC 2019 comes through, obviously as architects, we would expect that you would all be building, you know, well-shaded, you know, north and west facing glazing, that you would be designing well-insulated buildings. You'd be considering that, that you would be asking your clients, do you actually need, you know, six bedrooms, six bathrooms, there's only two of you, you know, do you need, do you really need a heated swimming pool? You know, like, like we, we assume that everyone would be asking that of their clients anyway. Um, that my big push about electrification is that if we don't electrify, we have no pathway to net zero emissions. So um, absolutely, you're right. But, you know, um, I really want to get the 
the message clear about what you're mm. Um, we're going to come to the end of it very quickly, I suppose. Um, but, you know, we've got a couple of minutes. Let's just keep going. You and I could talk for a, a, all day on a lot of these sort of situations and, and scenarios. Uh, this is an interesting one from Arabella on the chat. And she says, look, gas is being exported to the rest of the world and it is obviously being mined here in Australia. How can we influence as architects to reduce the dependency and also reduce the amount of gas export? Oh, we can't. That was well, nice. we, can, we can affect our local market. Yeah, okay. Um, interestingly enough, this presentation has actually spurred a few people onto action and there's a comment from Andrew McLeod, and hopefully he's no relative of yours, and he said, thanks very much, Jeremy. We're 100% green power from PowerShop, but I've been dragging my feet with, uh, feet with Architects Declare and he's absolutely inspired through the presentation and just wanted, wanted to pass on his thanks. So there you go, good, one McLeod. Good on you, cousin. Is he really your cousin? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, now let's, um, I suppose this is going to be my final question because I'm just conscious that other people have got to go to meetings and that kind of stuff and we all got to get back to work. But let's, let's talk about the final question. And this is somewhat inspirational, which is great. I'm just reading through a lot of the comments on here. Um, and they're all saying, thank you very much. I'm just trying to find the, the right question really, but it's, um, and it's from Rob Ashby. And this is a beautiful question to finish on actually. So thanks Rob for sharing this with us. He says, look, do you think there's anything beyond green power, anything beyond carbon neutrality that we should be thinking about as built environment leaders? A beautiful question to finish with. Jeremy McLeod, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, really great question, Rob. Um, yeah, look, there, there is. Um, and I've been, I've been trying really hard for the last year. I think that the interesting thing for me is that, you know, in 20 years of practice, we've been looking at embodied carbon, at building efficiency, at really pushing our clients to actually ask them what it is that they need and trying to build less. Um, but I, I think that um, I've worried that that message hasn't got through to a lot of people in our profession and it definitely hasn't got, hasn't got through to a lot of people in, in politics. So, which is why this message does seem so, so binary about, you know, uh, operational carbon. But I think that the things that we can do as architects is to actually really understand um, how important we are. Like it, it, in terms of, you know, the single biggest carbon emitter on the planet is um, carbon emissions through the built environment. Um, and then that's followed by cars and that's followed by, um, by uh, industrialized agriculture. Um, and so we have such a, such a critical role to play um, and it's diverse, right? So, it, so it, it might start with electrification, but then it's also about, you know, efficiency. It's also about embodied carbon. But I think more importantly, it's understanding that, um, that we have this big role to play in advocacy um, in, the, in the future of our city. And I think that we all need to be really thinking about um, what is it that we should be building? And what shouldn't we be building? And I think that we need to know, you know, when to say no um, and when to say yes. And so I think that, you know, it's interesting that the reason that I flashed up Architects Assist is that if you have the financial capacity, I would say contact Architects Assist. And so for us at Breed Architecture, we just asked, was there any RFS or CFA firefighters that lost their homes and they were un uninsured? In which case we would give them full services free from start through to completion. So that particular uh, firefighter and his family will be back in before Christmas this year because of Madeline in our office just working consistently to get, to get him back in. You know, I, I think that um, Nightingale Housing, you know, I, I didn't want to start a housing organisation and neither did Austin Maynard and neither did Six Degrees, neither did Claire Cousins. Um, but for us in Melbourne, seeing what was happening here, we felt that... Um, because there was a total lack of leadership that we had to lead. And so um, I feel like that you shouldn't be afraid, Rob, to kind of step into places where historically architects thought that they shouldn't. But if you see that something isn't being done and something that has to be done, I don't think we can stand by anymore as a profession. Mm. 
Thank you very much. Jeremy McLeod, you have um, gone above and beyond. Great presentation, a huge amount of conversation, a lot of action out of today's Lean In, which is great. I've loved it. Uh, the comments, and feel free to look at the chat box now if you want, but um, the comments from people coming in just talk about how inspirational this has been. It's actually, I'm now going off to tear up my origin contracts. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of really fantastic, practical, easy steps that we can do that don't cost a lot of money and won't take a lot of time. So you've really demystified the whole process. A lot of the time when you say engage a professional, it means all, you know, money, time, effort, all of those things. And it really isn't. And I just will remind everybody, for those of you who do want to further have this conversation with Jeremy and continue this conversation offline from this lean in, then Jeremy's email address is Jeremy, J-E-R-E-M-Y, Jeremy at breathe dot com dot au and i'm sure if you have any other questions advice guidance or anything that you need from a supportive um, member like jeremy then please do feel free to email him and um, he'll be in touch uh, with a response fairly soon so again on behalf of the institute of architects on behalf of the 350 people 400 people who are on today's call a massive thank you jeremy mcleod we really appreciate your time i'm tempted i will say this to get you back in uh, at another stage because i think that there are many other avenues that we could talk to you about so thanks again for your um, commitment so uh, in presenting today. We really do appreciate it. It's been great. Thank, thanks heaps, Michael. And I just want to ask everyone one last time, could you please, please uh, change your power supply if you haven't already to 100% green power? And could you please, as a practice, uh, commit to going carbon neutral? Um, and I'm happy to help wherever I can. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So that's it for today, everybody. Thank you so much for joining Jeremy and myself. I've really found today absolutely inspirational. I'm going off to do a couple of things now to, to um, keep continuing the action on that. Don't forget, look at Architects Assist as well. Um, and of course, today's session is being recorded and those slides that Jeremy presented together with the recording will be live on our Lean In page later on this evening as well. So don't forget if you want to rewatch any part of today's session, then that will be live there as well. Thanks again for joining me. I've been Michael Linky here at the Institute of Architects. Thanks so much for spending the last hour or so with me. And um, I look forward to seeing you again soon at a future lean-in. Until then, do stay safe and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks very much.